Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the, today's webinar hosted by AmCham's ESG Committee. I'm Una Claire Kim, Director of Government and Corporate Affairs at AmCham, and I'm very happy to kick off today's webinar. AmCham's ESG Committee was launched in March 2021 with a goal to promote ESG best practices and foster dialogue between the US and Korea in the ESG space. Thanks in large part to the excellent leadership shown by our committee co-chairs, the ESG committee has been very active in advancing important ESG related dialogues. Starting with today's webinar, the ESG committee this year is planning to offer quarterly webinars on different aspects of ESG, as well as the annual ESG forum in the second quarter. Today's webinar on the topic, uh, recent ESG trends and KESG is highly relevant to all of us here in Korea, especially as the Korean government has recently published its own KESG guidelines back in December last year. In that context, I'm very happy to have Mr. Kim dong Su uh, with us as our guest speaker today. Uh, Mr. Kim serves as a, uh, as a director of ESG Research Institute at Kim and Jang, which he actually studied this uh, starting this Monday. But previous to that, he also served as the director of the ESG Research Institute in the Korea Productivity Center, which is a government agency under the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy. Uh, the KPC also authored the KESG guidelines. Uh, Mr. Kim has extensive experience in sustainability issues and the development of sustainability related uh, guidelines and standards. Uh, in addition to his important role at the KPC, Mr. Kim is also in charge of the Sustainable, Sustainable Management Center at MOTI and serves as Director General of the CSR Center at the Ministry of SMEs and Startups. He earned his bachelor's from the University of Utah a message from Seoul National University and a PhD from KAIST. Um, so in terms of logistics, Mr. Kim will give a presentation for about 30 minutes um, and Jim Faltasek, our committee co-chair and senior vice president of 3M Asia Corporate Affairs will moderate a fireside chat with, with Mr. Kim. Uh, after that, we will have an audience Q&A. So please feel free to submit your questions by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. With that, Mr. Kim, let me hand it over to you. Yes, thank you to the guest and the American Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for your invitation. My name is Dong Su Kim, and I'm, a, I'm the director of the ESG Research Institute at Kim and John. Today, I'd like to talk about ESG trend and how companies can respond to the emerging ESG landscape, including the KESG guidelines. Uh, let me begin, with, uh, begin by briefly talking about business environment today. Between 1980 to 2020, the world population has increased from 4.4 billion people. It has almost doubled in the past 40 years. Over the same period, global GDP has increased from 11.3 trillion to 84.7 trillion US dollars, uh, an increase of almost the 7.5 times. It is true that we are living in an abundant world, but from a sustainability perspective, we are faced with a critical environment and social agenda. For instance, global wealth inequality in the past 40 years has grown significantly with the top 10% earning almost 10 times more than the bottom 10%. The global CO2 concentration has increased by approximately 22% and it's getting worse as we all recognize. Just look at the oceans in the past 300 years. Over 825 marine species have disappeared. Now you can only see these species in the literature of marine biology. Did you know that? I actually didn't know that until recently. Uh, I was born and raised in the, in, in the east coast of a small village. It's, it's called Gangu. Uh, it's right above uh, Pohang. It's, it's, it's a very small village. I, I witnessed the real impact of climate change on everyday life. Let me ask you a quick question. Uh, you don't have to answer, but, but ask yourself, does anyone know where the number one apple cultivation area is in Korea? Yeah, I'm sure some of, you, uh, some of the Korean participants here do. If any of you mentioned Daegu or Cheongsong, I think I can guess your age. It, it is a very outdated information. 
Now the number one cultivation area is Wonju, which is close to the border with North Korea. It's a very high altitude area. Over the past, uh, over the last 10 years, 45% of the apple cultivation area in Korea has vanished. Let me ask you another question. Um, where can you get halabong? Like uh, it's, it, it's a large citrus fruit, like, like a tangerine. It's a large tangerine. Uh, Koreans are shocked when I say that you can now get halabong in Jeollabukdo. Well, according to the Global Risk Report published by World Economic Forum, extreme weather events and related risks are the top global risks in the more complex and challenging world than ever before. Your business and our life risk increases because of environmental impact. CISRI reported that extreme weather risks accounted for 88% of insurance losses between 2005 and 2015. Sustainability is defined as a paradigm that promotes a sustainable development through economic, social, and environmental responsibilities. Again, there are three pillars, economic, social, and environment. And sustainable development aims to meet the needs of a present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Then how does it relate to ESG? The origin of ESG comes from the concept of sustainability. The term sustainability was the first used in Silvicultura Economica, a seminar book by Hans Kalowitz in 1713. Kalowitz stated that trees should not be cut down faster than they are allowed it to grow and he referred to this concept as sustainability. In 1987, the World Commission on Environment and Development published a report called Our Common Future, which defined sustainable development as a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This refers to what Kalovich proposed. Then in 1994, John Eckington advanced the concept of a triple bottom line, which suggests the firms should fulfill economic, social, environmental needs. Again, three pillars, economic, social, and environmental. He framed the sustainable development from the perspective of corporations. Later, when international financial organizations such as UNFI, UNPRI started to engage, they faced difficulties to implement the triple bottom line. I mean, sustainability framework as a financial entity, entities because they are already examining corporate economic performance in line with global accounting standard. So they had to take it out the conventional part of the economic section, but kept social and environmental aspects. How the government, government governance part, however, the governance part remained because each country has different regulations, standards and frameworks. That was year 2005 and 2006. If you search, if you search online, the first reference to ESG can be found in year 2000 and 2006, when financial, international financial entities started to engage. But it wasn't a popular term back then. In 2018, we saw a dramatic increase in interest in, 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 interest in ESG. In these days, everybody talks about ESG, but actual implementation started with institutional changes. According to MSCI research, 858 ESG-related regulations were introduced between 2010 and 2019. But 2018 and 2019 alone accounts for 48% of the total regulation increase. For instance, the EU non-financial reporting directive was introduced during this period. Now, it's not just the regulatory enforcement, but consumers are willing to pay a 10% higher price. And 39% of the employees cared more about their employers' effort in sustainability than they did in the past. 
as we are already experiencing millennials who are our, who are our potential consumers and employers, employees are very sensitive to, to this issue. 87% of investors answered that they always utilize the sustainability information in the, in, in the investment process. The global sustainable investment market has grown rapidly over the past few years, totaling 35.3 trillion US dollars in 2020. Large investors like SoftBank and BlackRock are increasingly investing in sustainability related ventures. People pay attention to, to ESG, not because it's a fashionable, but because the money is there, money is there. Sustainability has even spread to the cultural domain. Coldplay announced that their upcoming world tour would be as sustainable and low carbon as possible. They have established a science-based target for target over 50% reduction in CO2 compared to their previous world tour. And I'm not sure whether you can hear this, but um, let me try. Uh, let's hear Coldplay a little bit later. In, in the capital market, we see that sustainability has a positive impact. For instance, 90% of companies reduced their cost of capital, 88% of, uh, of companies experienced the higher operational performance and 80% saw an increase in their stock price. Then the question is, why should the private sector and not the public sector stand for ESG or sustainability? Why is it everyone asking you, you, I mean, businessmen and businesswoman to do it? Over the past 40 years, between 1978 and 1920, uh, 2019, the number of companies has increased by more than three times. And this is important. And the companies represent 92% of global GDP, which has a huge impact on the environmental and social demands. Whatever you do, it has a significant impact to environmental and social dimension. South Korea was ranked the 10th globally in terms of GDP as of 2020. And I'm sure many of you have heard about the Korea discount. In 2006, when the global average of power was 15.8, the power for Korean companies was 8.77. That's, there's a current discount, sure. In 2016, the global average was 15.03 compared to 10.86 for Korea. In 2018, it was much better. It, uh, but the global average power was 13.31 uh, compared to 11.39 for Korean companies. This is how Korean companies are currently viewed. We are still behind. Employees in Korea work 1.4 months longer than OECD average. That's worse than Chile, actually. There are very, very, and very few female executives in Korea. We all know this. How can we change this situation? What can we do as a company? ESG requires thinking outside of the box. To achieve a progress beyond the status of quo, quo, we need to introduce new perspectives and new approach. Here is an example of ESG in automobile uh, de development. To be honest, <laughs> I desperately tried to find a case other than an American company. I did. So I can avoid any positive or negative feedback from you guys today. BMW's IA concept car used the carbon fiber reinforced the polymer to reduce weight by 75%. Using shear power P, what does that mean? It means that the vehicle can go four times further if other conditions are equal. Energy usage during manufacturing is reduced by 50% and water consumption by 70%. 
If you are reluctant to implement the ESG strategies, you might take a passive or reactive ESG action. Then your return will not exceed your investment because you cannot meet the critical point of, of normal returns. If you are planning to formulate and or implement an ESG strategy, I would advise you to carefully take an active or proactive approach so that you can cross the critical point of ESG investment return. Again, um, Danish company, uh, again, it's, it's not an American company. Osted is the largest energy provider in Denmark. And just a few years ago, uh, Osted was the largest carbon emitter in the country. But now they produce 98% of their energy from renewable sources after selling their oil and gas business in 2017. Without proactive strategic change, Osted couldn't have made it this far. In this case of Osted, proactive strategic change was business portfolio management in terms of ESG. And now we are wondering what your proactive strategic change would be. In December 2021, Time Magazine picked Elon Musk as a person of the year. I'm, I'm, I'm personally not a big fan of Elon Musk, but I think this case is phenomenal. Um, there is an interesting column in the magazine comparing good leaders and great entrepreneurs. However, while the leaders use leverage to grow and scale businesses through existing principles, entrepreneurs consistently challenge and innovate based on their own unique philosophies and attributes, all without fearing failure. And today, the world is asking corporate leaders, including leaders of 14 invested companies in Korea, what changes and innovations can you make? Like Carl Sagan once mentioned in his speech, to save our home, our home planet, the Pei Buddha. Korean government introduced the KESG guideline. KESG guideline has cons uh, uh, consists of over 61 indicators across 27 topics and the four key areas of ESG management, disclosure, environment, soci society, and governance. It's, it, it has ESG fillers, but interestingly, it has one more pillar, which is the disclosure part. Korean government thought, you know, it's, it's reasonable to push forward the disclosure, transpar increase transparency of uh, communication between company and investor. So these are the uh, topics and indicators. So unfortunately, it doesn't provide an English version, but uh, Korea, uh, Korea Productivity Center and Korean government will provide it shortly. Otherwise, Kim and Jang will do, don't worry. And the KES, when we developed a KESG guideline, uh, actually I was uh, in charge of developing KESG guideline, and we reviewed the 13 uh, in the internationally widely used ESG related guidelines, standards, and framework, including MSCI KLD, Dow Jones Sustainability Index, TCFD, SASB, GRI, and other guidelines and standards, and also assessment criteria. And uh, these 61 indicator set are common criteria that are most uh, used in those frameworks. So if you implement KESG guideline. Actually, you are covering those largely and widely accepted global standards and guidelines. Thank you for your, uh, thank you for the time. Awesome, thank you, Mr. Kim. This is Jim Faltasek from 3M Company. And uh, uh, boy, you covered a lot and, and I have notes all over. So I'm, I'm going to try to um, put them together in a way in which um, we can, you know, we can make some, make some sense and have some good conversation. Um, you know, I will again remind everybody in the audience, please submit some questions and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can over the, the course of the next half an hour or so. 
Um, but but I will will start by you know uh, again thanking you, Mr. Kim, for your time and and preparing um, to give us this you know a, a really significant overview of of the history of of ESG. And I think uh, you know um, you've shown some you know some of the progress that we've made, but but more importantly, I think some of the challenges we have coming into the future. Um, some of the the questions that that um, popped into my head that that weren't necessarily um, uh, uh, planned, but but came up as a result of of listening to the presentation, and, and maybe I would like to to start in a couple of places there. You, you know, I, I mean, you know, maybe the the first question I have will be at a you know that this investor level. And uh, it, interesting, I had a a conversation with my daughter this morning. Um, she's in the U.S. She just graduated. Um, from from university and starting in the workplace. And so she was telling me about she had her first call with a, a financial planner. She's very, you know, very diligent on, on planning for the future. And what she told me was, um, you know, her plan is to invest in, um, you know, eco-friendly companies. You, you know, that's that's going to be her strategy. And you showed a, a graphic there that that says you know companies in ESG you know that are active and and proactive you, you know increase profits significantly you know my my question you know very generally to get us to get us started um, is as you as we as outsiders look at other companies so we're looking at at companies as investors. How do we tell? I mean, I like that graph, right? If I'm an investor, I want to I, I want to invest in companies that are active and, and proactive in ESG because the, the graph that you showed showed that to be um, really, you know, really uh, dynamic. How do we tell from the outside um, where companies would would land? You, you know, how do we tell if if companies are active or proactive in ESG? Thank you for your captain. That's really good captain. Companies are having a hard time, not just American companies, but companies in general. They are having a hard time to communicate with companies because ESG is a buzzword, but um, companies are used to communicate with different languages. Like, here's my productivity. Here's my you know, value added compared to previous years. Here's our um, IPA. But now you have to tell them that you are going to perform much, much better, not just the today, but also future in the long term. This is something you are not used to doing. So actually empowering your employee is extremely important by providing ESG training or learning. I mean, your employees, not just you, but also your employees are not really used to, to communicate with this kind of language. So number one, empowering. Empowerment is important. Number two, disclosure. This is interesting research. Um, MIT conducted a research about corporate ESG disclosure. Then whether it's true or not, whether you perform better or not, the more you disclose, you have the better feedback. Mm -hmm. Investors are saying, oh, okay. I mean, regardless of good or bad performance, but investors are very relieved. Uh, wow, gosh, you are practicing and implementing uh, ESG. So they are relieved. So, I mean, the next step, of course, they are going to push forward and you, your performance indicator sets. But you know, by showing your ESG performance and disclosing, whether it's in, on your website or in sustainable report, you know, it already helps. So empowering your, uh, your employees and also, you know, to, dis to, to start to disclose your ESG information more transparently, this will help. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you, you know, um... You, you bring up this idea of disclosure and, and transparency. And, uh, you know, I think that 
that presents a whole you know slew of questions based on you know you presented kind of the KESG guidelines, and so maybe maybe uh, you know a, a few questions on on that to start is you know maybe at the highest level is how you know how closely do those KESG guidelines match up to global? So you, you know many you know I think there's many uh, global. Uh, companies on on the call today, for instance, and so um, as as you look at that, does KESG line up fairly consistently with with global guidelines? Yeah, um, like I mentioned, that this is a, a easy answer um, because the KESG guideline inherent will reference certain global and domestic ESG guidelines and frameworks. Uh, I, as I mentioned, the MSCI, SMP, DJSI. Sustainable Analytics, SASB, TCFD, and these institutional, uh, internationally used uh, guidelines and standards. So we live with the 13 um, standards. Then KESG guideline matches about 87%, almost 90% with global standards and guidelines. So by practicing this, you're not just actually fulfilling one particular, like such as a TCFD, or CDP, one particular standard or guidelines, but actually you are fulfilling multiple guidelines and standards. So it does have an advantage. I mean, this is not developed by private sector for commercial purpose. This has been developed actually not just for uh, Korean large companies, but also small, medium enterprises, as well as uh, uh, foreign invested companies. And non -list, not just the listed companies, but also non-listed companies, and for non-commercial purpose. So they conducted the research, and I was charging, and last three years, for three years of research, rigorous research to review all indicator sets, because you know government was so afraid if Korean companies cannot meet the global demand, international standards or guidelines, frameworks, or investors requirement, mm -hmm. then Korean GDP will be impacted because we are 88% of our I mean, GDP comes from import and export business. So we do have to meet the international demand. So KESG is all about fulfilling international standards and guidelines. Okay, good. Um, you, you know, and I think I, I'm going to ask a question. Um, you know, my my co-chairs and the the team from AmCham. You know, as as Una shared a little bit earlier. You know, we've got uh, you know some plans for more webinars throughout the year with with maybe more focus. So one of the the ones coming up that I think uh, Balaka Niazi from P and G will moderate is is more on the the social piece of of ESG but i but i do want to ask the question um, here because you laid out um, you, you know specifically looking at at two points you know gender issues and working hours in in korea um, are are uh, Problem children, if you will, um, for you, you know, for for Korean companies and and Korea results right now. And when you laid out the KSG guidelines indicator, you, you know, and I, I know that was just a snapshot, but I'm interested in in your thoughts on the social piece of of the the KESG guidelines um, that have been laid out with you know in respect to the social piece of that. Do the will the guidelines help guide companies um, so that that Korea overall we can make an improvement um, in in this particular category? Say, for instance, that's showing on the screen. That's a good and painful question. Um, limitation of KESG is. It does not provide a reference point, but it is a guideline. But hopefully, if we can provide the reference sets of data, so individual companies can compare their performance, 
with their peers. Yep. That's a current plan, but guideline itself doesn't provide a reference point. But okay. by providing sets of data, but you don't know which companies are they, are, are they. But you can compare with your industry peers to trace your performance over time. Yeah. So that's a current uh, plan. Yeah. So I think that is you know thanks thanks for that that honest answer, and I think that is one of uh, one of the missions of of our committee in AmCham is to help, and I think that's. That's going to be up to us as business leaders because I I look at a, a graph like this and, and certainly um, feel uh, obliged if if not passionate but I do feel passionate about helping us make a change um, in this graph right here. So I think you know me and many others on on the call for sure. So I think that's the you know that's a a, a very helpful. Um, and as you said, maybe painful <laughs> question and answer, but I think it, it lays clearly that we have we have a job to do. Um, so thanks for that. Maybe uh, you, you know uh, one or two more questions, and then I'll try to to get to the audience questions. But you know, um, renewable is a big you know is is of course a you know a big and important topic and and, and a big part of of ESG. And you know we talk about RE100, you know this this you know the global you know strive for getting to 100% renewable energy. Um, you know, for for me, I'll, I'll I'll speak for for 3M for a second. We're at at 50%. Globally, we're at 50% renewable energy globally. You know, on our way, and we, we you know we believe we're we're a little bit ahead globally of 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 where we want to be at this time in, you know, in, in our move towards 100%. But I would say that we have maybe some more challenges in Korea just because of uh, capacity, you know, the, the renewable capacity. And I'm, I'm curious as to um, hear your, your thoughts on kind of the the work going on to increase the amount of available capacity of renewable in Korea, and yeah, and maybe what 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 we as as companies uh, might be able to do. Um, that that's that's a very good question. Um, in in short term, it's it's a pain, and it's it's a very painful time, not just for Korean companies, but also for you know other countries. Um, energy security is is huge. I mean, everybody is uh, anticipating that um, fossil fuel usage is going to be increased uh, in short short run. Of course, it, it's. I mean, that's there's no alternative options for, at the moment uh, because of a gas line from Russia. Um, it's true, and uh, energy price also increases over time. So fossil fossil fuel is an alternative option at the moment, but for Korea is going to, with new government, the Korea is going to introduce energy mix strategy, which including nuclear power plant, biomass, and also uh, future technologies, in, including small, small modular reactor, as well as a fusion energy type of things. And so not just renewable energy, but also alternative energy mm -hmm. should be in the conversation to solve short-term problem. And in the long term, Korean government, not just Korean government, but also you know, any government with limited capacity for renewable energy, I think they are going to um, make a collaboration with other countries. I mean, we do live in a small country with low quality of solar power, solar power and with low quality of wind for wind, offshore wind or on-land wind power. So we do need to collaborate with other countries. This includes, you know, I mean, countries that we do not have a trade or, or a really strong relationship. We have to explore new possibilities to achieve this target because we all know that we do have a limited capacity. Right, good. I think uh, 
yeah, we, we, we do have a lot of work to do in that, in that area. Maybe I, I'm going to ask one, one more question. And then um, I think I've got a couple of audience questions that, that we'll be able to get to. And if there are more uh, uh, from the audience, please, please share. Uh, but, you know, maybe practically speaking, um, you, you know, uh, you have many business leaders on the line today. And, you, you know, I, 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 for one, always like to walk away from a session like this with, with maybe some, something actionable, you, you know, something, you know, some to-do item. It's my, it's my nature. So uh, maybe thinking about this from a couple of perspectives, you know, whether it's, uh, you, you know, maybe uh, Korean companies, you know, so thinking of, of Korean-based um, companies, but also thinking of foreign invested multinational companies in Korea. Um, what should we be looking for? So what do you, you know, maybe the, the way I'd like to ask this question is what do you see as maybe some of the biggest gaps generally that we as business leaders should be looking at within our companies um, to make progress against some of the, the ESG uh, guidelines that have been laid out. Yeah, oh, thank you for the question. Um, two, two, two things. Um, one, information disclosure is a hot issue in Korea. It is true. For listed Korean companies as of 2025, size more than 2 billion US dollars, need to start to disclose their ESG information according to Korea Stock Exchange. And uh, this will affect all listed companies. However, we have not discussed about three areas. One, non-listed companies. Two, foreign invested companies. Three, small, medium size. But already European Commission show the case, you know, they, they just come up with, they just introduced the uh, um, ESG information, sustainable related information disclosure for foreign invested companies in European countries. And regardless of the uh, corporate size, above uh, employee number 500. So now we are thinking why we, shouldn't have that kind of a policy. So it is a coming, not because it increases your communication transparency with investors and all, or other broader stakeholders, but this will be required sooner or later. So I would strongly recommend you also to think to disclosure, but I, if I were you, I wouldn't spend a whole lot of money to publish a sustainability report, but start to disclose information on your Korean website will, will help a lot to increase you know, positive feedback from Korean stakeholders. Second, um, I would recommend you to do what you can do much better than Korean companies. Like for instance, diversity issue. But here's the one thing you need to you know, step forward. For instance, when we talk about diversity issue, Korean companies, you know, think about automatically, it's a gender issue, male and female. Maybe diversity issue is about age. When you visit Korean companies, you see young generations and all the people, so and so on. It's a very high hierarchy. But maybe you can you have a better idea about diversity. Maybe like uh, his or her age 50 can join your company if the person has the ability to do it. Maybe young people can be a leader, corporate leader in your company, uh, rather than seniority. Maybe when we talk about diversity, it, it, not just the gender, but it's about you know, how you see your company, how you want to run your company, what is, it's about your corporate culture and management pr principle. So maybe you can show what really ESG means, specifically in social dimension, like diversity 
you can show different case other than compared to what Korean companies currently show. Yep. Good, thank you. I think uh, again, good, good messages for all of us. I think there is a, uh, I'm gonna see if I can get to the questions, maybe the uh, one question that I think is related to, to this right here. Let me see if I can get it right. Can SMEs in Korea afford to implement ESG collection measure and analyze the key metrics um, you know, the scope, scope one, scope two, and scope through, scope three, plus the social metric. So really the, uh, I think the, the question is, is, you know, in that, that first part, can the SMEs in Korea afford to, to do that? Your, your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, um, scope one and two, um, it, I believe scope one and two, we don't have a alternative option. So, I mean, it's a wish to go for it. But the question is a scope three. But on scope three, um, just yesterday, um, US Security Exchange and, and Commission uh, voted on climate change disclosure on 10K report. And uh, the result was, you know, company has to disclose scope one and two, it's a mandatory and strongly recommended if the company has a significant impact with scope, scope three. So, and, and also current discussion in European Commission is hugely focused on scope three. So scope three is on the radar. So if you are a corporate reader and uh, have, wants to manage uh, ESG risks in advance, I would recommend you to take a carefully look at scope three emission. Uh, but the thing is uh, um, whether SMEs are ready or not for this kind of regulatory enforcement. Um, unfortunately, I would say no, not yet. But for Korean SMEs, again, no alternative choice for Korean companies. I mean. Most of Korean SMEs are depending on import and export business. Yeah. And there's even catch a phrase, Google Palpa. You know, they hire 99% of employees in Korea and they they make 88% of, uh, of uh, GDP. And also this GDP, eight, eight, 88, another 88% of this GDP depends on trade business. And if US, Europe stands for it, then we don't have an option. Right. That's our reality. Yeah. And and maybe this is this is probably a question, and maybe maybe we touched on it, but I think um, related. So you know, the, the question was, could you go back to your last page of indicators? And uh, in in your view, how well is are those indicators? How well is ESG understood by Korean companies? You know, I think that's what we're trying to do with sessions like this, but we have, you know, it looks like we have, you know, 90, 91 or so companies represented here today. Um, <laughs> you know, some will, will watch the, the, the video following this, but so there's many companies that need to, to understand this, this better. How well understood do you think it is? Um, pers personally, um, we actually, when we conducted the research, we had a pilot test with large and small medium enterprises. We sampled, uh, if I remember correctly, so above 20 companies, and uh, including listed and non listed and small mediums. And, uh, and interestingly, um, we found that there's a, very limited uh, um, differences between listed and non-listed and large and small. So the level of knowledge are about the same, but the resource availability for SMEs and non-listed companies are not there yet. That's yeah. how we felt. Yeah. Um... Maybe a, a, again another trying to 
to link these questions together, um, which I appreciate the, the audience for, for helping me with that. Um, but to that point, you, you know, are, like which, you know, which industries, sectors, companies do you see um, leading ESG adoption in Korea? You know, so, so I would rather than companies, maybe think about sectors and industries and yeah. which ones are, which ones maybe are falling behind and, and why? Um, companies like uh, Samsung, LG, I mean, companies with, you know, trade in, in trade business sector, like uh, electricity and uh, home appliance. And in those industries are leading definitely. Yeah. And also heavy industries are just uh, about to start. And construction industries, few companies are leading in global, but many of the construction companies are getting behind it. So there are a few industries are uh, performing better and a few industries such as uh, um, biochemical and also um, pharmaceutical, they are getting behind and they just started and to implement the ESG. But there are companies which are exposed in global market and, and, and already they are experiencing you know, ESG needs since I would say 2013 and 15. But few industries like uh, heavy industries and, 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 and those chemical industries, they've been asked that, you know, it's, it's a consumer's demand. I mean, construction company says, you know, if you are not requiring, you know, these sets of indicator and not paying for it, and, and, and how am I supposed to, you know, pay more money for environmentally friendly uh, raw materials? Mm -hmm. So that's their common complaint. And uh, so there are a few industries uh, are, are getting behind, but in these days, they also understand this is not just a risk, risk management, but also opportunity to grow. I mean, for instance, uh, in energy industry, it, it was uh, always about refinery for Korean oil companies, but now they are, maybe there's a biofuel opportunity and just uh, reviewing the data, uh, starting two years ago, I, I can see in their financial report, there are there, there is a, a biofuel income. So companies are changing. And even in construction company, with construction company, there's a, when, when I review their financial report and I see categories of environmentally friendly buildings, mm -hmm. which is new category, something, this is something I haven't seen it before. So which means they also see this as their business opportunity to explore. Yeah, which is, which is, uh, uh, I mean, as as business people, we should be excited and embracing those opportunities, right? Because I think we are we are generally on the very early stages of you know all of these developments. So there's there's many opportunities uh, ahead. You know, so I, I received a follow up question as you were answering that question. Um, the, the question is, is, you know, is there a need for consultants to help Korea companies through the ESG uh, journey? Well, I, I, if this is a surprising question to me. I mean, consultancy market for ESG, it's a hot. Yeah, yeah. It's a hot. It's a, it's a demand pooling market. I mean, supply or shortage. Yeah. I mean, for Korean companies, especially uh, consultant who can provide the services, not just in domestic, but also overseas operations, they are really hot in these yeah. days. And unfortunately, price increased compared to last year, about 30 to 40% oh. by providing same quality of service. Yeah. So the consulting market is very hot. Any of you in here, a consultant from you know, American company, you should jump in if you are not in ESG service, but this is about time to change. Right. I, I you know, I mean, I think it, it hits on those, those two very important buttons. It's very complex and it's very important. You know, I, I think you've laid out both of those, those cases uh, during your, your presentation today, right? It's, it's, it's difficult to fully understand it. Um, there's a lot of, gray and, and complexity to it. And 
it's also incredibly important for us. So I think I, I, I think you're right. I, I smiled as I read that question as well because I think I, I, I would have answered it the same way for sure. Um, so I'm going to I'm I'm trying to read this question. Um, you know, it's it's uh, and uh, in Korea there are several ministries recommending ESG and and the voluntary certificate support to industries on top of. MOTI release the KESG guideline. So more, more releases. So depending on the industry sector, you know, the, the closer industry may be diverse, but it may not be MOTI first. So, you know, the question is any recommendation or prospect um, for, you know, industry or industries on, on what and how to move forward given that, you know, kind of that landscape. Yeah, um, this is a bit tough question. Um, easy and tough question. Um, currently, uh, market is very dynamic. It's it changes over time. It's a very rapidly changed. Um, so, I think I have to think through this question, and maybe I should submit. I'm mean, share with Korea, uh, American Chamber of Commerce in this format. Yeah, and I I thought a couple of times about this question. And I don't really have a good answer for this at the moment. Yeah, so I think it goes back to this, you know, I, I mean, for from my perspective anyway, this complexity, mm -hmm. you, you know, there's there's not one set of guidelines that everybody can and, and uh, you know, kind of aspire to and, and, and understand and, and measure their sel themselves against um, because there's there's so many different, there's so many different um, ways of looking at and and measuring, and and grading, right? And rating, right? So, yeah, very very difficult. Um, maybe but, but, one. But I, can, but I can answer one quick uh, thing is um, it's a more moving toward voluntary to involuntary. So yeah. more. Accounting, legal perspective is needed when you practice. So when you choose any guidelines, standards, or any any practices or programs when you select, then you have to think whether you can actually present with this program with accounting terms or or communicate in legal terms. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's how, I mean, that's why um, in America, SASB and TCFD are team up with uh, IFRS, and IFRS now team up with um, ISB and with legal and accounting, you know, entities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also, uh, uh, yesterday, like like uh, SEC. U.S. SEC announced, uh, you know, they when they announced the, the result of voting for climate change on 10K report, they mentioned we are calling legal and accounting attention. Okay. So that was a sentence on, on top of the press release. Yeah. Again, say maybe, you know, the importance continues to, to, to grow. <laughs> and, yeah. and this voluntary to involuntary, as you said before. Uh, maybe one last question before we wrap up, and and I think it's a it's a good question. Um, so you you talked about maybe some companies like Samsung, LG as examples um, leading the way, and you know maybe the question is you know are, is there any specific statistics or or metrics that cause you to easily answer with with those companies as, as leading the way. So what is it about those, what those companies are doing that, that causes you to answer that? Yeah, um, I'm not quite sure whether it's today or tomorrow, but soon. Samsung is, it is going to announce that they are going to include scope three carbon emission. In okay. In, in their sustainability disclosure, in their ESG disclosure, um, this will change, will, will have a huge influence 
not just the Korean companies, but also other companies in other countries. I mean, they are they they have decided Skull Three is in. No more discussion. Yeah. So they set the standard. So for many cases, few com companies which are leading in 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 product or service or, or even industry level, somehow they come come up with quite often or from time to time pretty cool idea or or strategy. Now this time for Samsung is a score three. And this is something you know everybody is a bit reluctant by saying, well, we're not sure, not me, but whether my supplier are ready or not. Yeah. And we're not sure, you know, how much financial impact that we have to calculate. Uh, of course, the cost as well. Right, but right. now they are setting the bar. So scroll three is in the discussion, no more without yeah. So I think that goes, that goes back to, you know, kind of the, where we started this, this fireside chat questioning is, you know, this, this idea of re, you know, companies that are proactive are, are showing these better results. And I think those are some, some, some good examples there of showing what does being proactive mean and, and therefore what can, and maybe we expect for, for results in the long term. Well, I think that that about takes us. I know there's maybe a couple of more questions that we haven't gotten to, but um, I think we're about at the end of time. So I think, you know, once again, thank all the audience members, first of all, for, um, you know, your participation and, and providing some some great, great questions for us to to discuss today. Um, you know, so I will, you know, say one more time. Um, thank you to you, Mr. Kim. Um, Maybe the last, you know, the, the one of the last comments that I read, it, you know, sets up uh, maybe some of the future, um, you, you know, the, the comment read, you know, from my opinion, one of the reasons why Korea's ESG level, specifically gender issues, you know, are still low is because they don't apply global level of ESG into Korea, even, you know, even with their global experience. And I, um, I would say on, you know, on behalf of, of my ESG committee co-chairs, um, Andrew Ru of Dow and Balaka Niazi of, of P and G, you know, that's that's our our mission is to help all of us collectively get better and allow us to um, you know to have up Korea standing in all of those those components. And that's why we've chosen to to try to focus a, a little bit uh, more in depth in some of these issues going um, as we look forward to the to the rest of the year, um, so that we can you know we can collectively I think make a make a big difference. So thank you, Mr. Kim, for for starting us off on that journey, and I imagine we'll have some more conversations going forward. So thank you again for your time, and I will turn it over to Una to to maybe wrap this up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kim, again for your very insightful presentation. Uh, I personally learned a lot uh, about the ESG trends and the specifics and challenges here in Korea, especially. So uh, thank you. And thank you, Jim, for moderating the, the fireside chat uh, expertly with all the questions. For the questions that we couldn't get to, we'll try to uh, follow up with uh, them uh, after the session. So, uh, so we'll do that. And we'll also have a recording of today's uh, webinar available via our YouTube channel. So feel free to check it out once uh, that becomes available in, uh, in, uh, in the next few days. Um, and as I mentioned before, and, and Jim uh, also reinforced this during his comments, is the ESG committee will be holding a series of speaker engagements for, uh, uh, for the rest of the year. And uh, we hope that many of you will be able to participate in, in those sessions. And if you have any questions about the ESG committee at MCHAM, please feel free to reach out to Jim or myself, and we'll be happy to uh, uh, you know, talk to you about that. And once again, I'd like to thank all the speakers today, Jim and Mr. Kim. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us and I hope you have a great rest of the week. Thank you.